February 20th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Luke chapter 7 from the New Testament. After Jesus had finished teaching all this to the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave who was highly regarded, but who was sick and at the point of death. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they urged him earnestly, He is worthy to have you do this for him, because he loves our nation, and even built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not presume to come to you. Instead, say the word, and my servant must be healed. For I too am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. He turned and said to the crowd that followed him, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. So when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave well. Soon after, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the town gate, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, who was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bear and those who carried it stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. So the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they began to glorify God, saying, A great prophet has appeared among us, and God has come to help his people. This report about Jesus circulated throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. John's disciples informed him about all these things, so John called two of his disciples and sent them to Jesus to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? At that very time, Jesus cured many people of diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and granted sight to many who were blind. So he answered them, Go tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news proclaimed to them. Blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see, a man dressed in fancy clothes? Look, those who wear fancy clothes and live in luxury are in king's courts. What did you go out to see, a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, no one is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he is. Now all the people who heard this, even the tax collectors, acknowledged God's justice because they had been baptized with John's baptism. However, the Pharisees and the experts in religious law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. To what then should I compare the people of this generation and what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to one another. We played the flute for you, yet you did not dance. We wailed in mourning, yet you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunk, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is vindicated by all her children. Now one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him, so he went into the Pharisee's house, took his place at the table. Then when a woman of that town, who was a sinner, learned that Jesus was dining at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfumed oil. 
As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. She wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and anointed them with the perfumed oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. So Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He replied, Say it, teacher. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed him 500 silver coins and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss of greeting, but from the time I entered, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfumed oil. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, are forgiven, thus she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say amongst themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? He said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. God, it would have been so interesting to live at the time when Jesus was here on earth. I think, I think about that a lot that I wonder if I would be as confused as everybody else, or possibly more confused than everybody else. You know, even John, uh, incredible prophet, knew about the coming Christ, was baptizing people. Even he wasn't too sure. He saw this person named Jesus doing all of these miracles and all these things, and he's like, yeah, I'm still not even sure if you're Jesus. And the poor Pharisees, who I, I realize for the most part, they're, they're not a good group of, of guys, but the poor Pharisees tried to figure out kind of what he was doing up until now. They had always gone through this incredibly laborious and detailed process of having their sins forgiven uh, through the temple, um, what we're reading about in the Old Testament videos right now. Uh, and that was the only way that they understood that they could have their sins forgiven. So here they are at dinner and Jesus says to the woman, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> and they're like, what? You can't forgive anybody's sins. Uh, only if we bring a ram and we do this and then the priest goes and does this and then on this one day. And So it must have been a, a kind of confusing time back then for a lot of people who saw you. And we see amazing stories like the centurion who was a Gentile who already was on board with who you were uh, and you shared in kind to him by not only helping heal his, his slave, but also with, with kindness saying to him um, how much faith he actually had. And especially at that time for a Gentile to have that. But then I kind of skip forward to now when we definitely know who your son is. Uh, we definitely know who you are. We have a church on every street corner right next to a Starbucks. We have access to four million different versions of the Bible. Uh, it would greatly surprise me, greatly surprise me if there were actually people who had lived in the United States for any length of time who didn't know that there was a person named God, whether they believed in you or not. So here we have everything handed to us in a bow <laughs> in a beautiful package tied with a bow here is god here's his son here's how he died and here's why he died um, here's why he came to earth here's the process for the forgiveness of your sins there's no confusion in there like there was when jesus was here on earth and and the Jewish people were having to change from this concept of not having direct access to God to suddenly uh, Jesus was going to be that connection for them uh, to now speak to God. 
there was a lot of confusion back then, but there shouldn't be that much confusion nowadays. People like to argue about the Bible and uh, things about you, uh, and that's fine. You gave us a brain, you gave us free will, but on top of that, for us to have any more confusion on top of that, to me, is kind of baffling. Again, going back to the centurion, he didn't need a whole lot to already believe that Jesus was exactly who he knew was coming. Um, he wasn't as familiar as the Jewish people because he was a Gentile at the time. But as soon as he heard about Jesus, he knew uh, who he was and his faith was great. So we already know who Jesus is. Uh, again, we've been blessed with Sunday schools and videos and <laughs> all of this information about you. And yet sometimes we still go through our day-to-day -day existence of having a relationship that's set apart from you, uh, where we try and do things on our own. Uh, we don't want to be obedient. We want things the way we want them. And so it's not even any so much anymore that we don't know who Jesus is. And it's definitely not that we don't know who you are. We're pretty clear about that from, from the word you gave us in the Bible. But what baffles me is we have all of this at our fingertips. Shouldn't the Christian relationship have gotten stronger the more that we know about you rather than this weakness that has come upon society? I don't know. I just really struggle with that. So I saw this great quote the other day, God, from uh, Carson Lowry who said, people do not drift towards holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate towards godliness, prayer, obedience to scripture, faith, and delight in the Lord. We drift toward compromise and call it tolerance. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control and call it relaxation. We slide toward godlessness and convince ourselves we have been liberated. And today, God, I just, I just want to pray for that. Our society has slid so far away from you. We have, we have easier access to your word and to a relationship with you uh, more than ever before. Definitely more than before your son came. And, and yet we're further away from you as a society than anything else. So today I pray for our society. I pray for the hearts of this world I pray for comfort as a sin in this world. I pray for tolerance as a sin in this world. I pray for all the things that we have chosen to make right in this world so that we feel okay living in this world, that we have come this far away from what you've actually asked us to do. This has to do with relationships. This has to do with finances. This has to do with how we do church. This has to do with how how the church now views disciples. We've gotten so far away from what you've actually talked about and asked us to do in the Bible. So today, God, let us all remember that we as a society have fallen one small bit from one small bit from one small bit over generation over generation, and we have come so far away from what it is that you've actually called us to do. We don't have an excuse where we're confused whether Jesus is the coming Christ or not. Our only excuse is arrogance and ego and desire to be comfortable in our, in our Christianity. I love what um, Pastor Francis Chan says, what the world doesn't need is Christians who tolerate the complacency in their own lives. So today, God, help us to not be complacent in our own lives, that we strive harder and more intentional uh, to seek a relationship with you, to seek a relationship with your son uh, and do what you truly have called us to do, not what society has called us to do. We love you so much. In your son's name we pray. Amen.